In the previous video, we installed an AMR 500 supercharger on our 719cc Kubota diesel engine that powers our lightweight Honda Insight. And this happened. So, as expected, the supercharger gave our 20 horsepower diesel engine a much needed boost in power. Now, speaking about boost, well, that's where it gets interesting. You see, we're only making four pounds of boost off idle, and the gauge shows a maximum of five pounds of boost when the engine spun to highway speeds. All this is very interesting. So today we're gonna to take a closer look at the current setup so we can devise a plan to move forward with this project. Now, one of the data points we'll be looking at today is the fuel economy, because surely this stupid charger will have an effect on that. Now, prior to the installation of the stupid charger, this little Honda was able to deliver a mind-blowing 71 miles per gallon on a rural driving test. And keep in mind, no special tricks or driving techniques are used when we test for fuel economy. We just drive the car normally, with one exception. The top speed is limited to 55 miles per hour, and that's because, well, the speed limit on most of the roads we travel is 55 miles per hour. Now here's another question we need answers for. How hot is the intake charge getting, and do we need an intercooler? Well, now's the time to find out. So on this boost pipe that feeds the intake manifold the pressurized air, we installed a thermal couple so we can keep track of the intake charge temperatures with this meter. Now we do have an intercooler on hand if we need one, but let's find out first by doing some testing. So on this car, the supercharger's packed tightly in the engine compartment, and to make matters worse, the exhaust downpipe is pretty darn close. Is this going to be a problem? Well, we'll find out. But consider this. The supercharger, the exhaust, and the air filter for the intake are located directly in the airflow. Now, will this direct air cooling be enough to keep everything nice and cool, or are we going to have some more problems? Well, I can tell you this. It's not an accident that this stuff ended up here. So before we get started with our road test, let me explain how we actually measure fuel consumption. So this is a drawing of the modified fuel tank that we installed in the car. Over here is the supply line for the engine, and over here is the return line. Now before we begin our fuel economy test, we pump the fuel out of the tank by temporarily placing an electric fuel pump on the return line. This will empty the tank to this level. At this point, we can add a known quantity of fuel to the tank, and for our test, we go by weight and not volume. So for an example, we typically add a fuel load of 14,000 grams of fuel to the tank to bring it up to this level. Now naturally, the fuel level will drop during the fuel economy test, and after the test, we again pump the tank down to this level and then weigh the remaining fuel. The amount of fuel that we used is the difference between the beginning and the ending weights. It's pretty much that simple. As a bonus, this method is very accurate. The only issue is the time it takes to do this. Now, pumping the tank down is simple and it doesn't take long at all. However, before and after each test, we have to make sure that the temperature of the fuel is about the same, and that means the car has to sit for a few hours after the test for the fuel temperatures to stabilize. I'm not sure how much of a difference this makes, but as far as the science goes, this is the right thing to do. Now, the reason we don't just completely fill the fuel tank like normal people do, then drive around and then fill the tank again, you see, given that this car gets better than average fuel economy, we would have to drive the car for about 600 miles in order to get accurate numbers. Meh, nobody wants to drive this thing that long. I guarantee that. So before we started the fuel economy test, we did a few hard launches to get an idea how much coal this car is pumping out. Here, have a look. So as you can see, the exhaust gets a bit smoky on hard launches, and that's both good and bad. The good news is, the dark exhaust means we have plenty of fuel being delivered to the engine, and we can afford to add more boost. Now, once we add more boost, we'll be able to clean up the exhaust, and as a bonus, we'll also see an increase in power. So far, so good. However, today we're going to be leaving the boost right where it's at. Fast forward a bit and we have the fuel tank topped off and we're ready to begin our fuel economy test. 
Now, this is an interesting side note. The little diesel engine doesn't like to be driven immediately after a cold start with this supercharger. For a moment or two, it seemed like the cold engine lost a cylinder or two, but that quickly cleared up after a few seconds of driving. To put that in human terms, well, think about waking up and immediately going for a walk without the benefit of a hot and tasty cup of coffee. Yeah, this poor car really needs to warm up for a few minutes before it's driven. I think I mentioned this in previous videos. Anyway, I really hate doing fuel economy tests, and that's because of the time it takes to do all the measuring, and on top of that, the car actually has to be driven. Now, driving this car, well, it really isn't all that bad, but this time of the year, the landscape is somewhat bland. You know, you really don't see much other than cows, which, as I understand, are marsupials and are somehow related to dinosaurs. Well, to be honest, animals are not my specialty, and maybe it shows. Anyway, at highway speeds, the supercharger is developing a solid 5 pounds boost. You know, on a positive displacement supercharger, boost is boost, and we see about 2 pounds of boost at idle and 5 pounds at road speeds. The difference between the two is due to the engine speed. At idle, the supercharger is spinning a lot slower and a lot of air bleeds away. However, once the compressor speeds up, it becomes a little bit more efficient. Obviously, turbos work differently and depend on the flow of the exhaust to spin the turbine, which in turn spins the compressor, and that's what makes boost on a turbo. On a positive displacement supercharger, like this AMR500, each revolution of the supercharger pumps 500 cc's of air into the intake manifold. The good thing about this method of forced induction is, boost is generated instantly and without any delay, which is nice on a small, underpowered car like this one. So whether we run a turbo or a supercharger, the energy it takes to produce boost isn't free. A turbo creates back pressure in the exhaust, which has a negative effect on performance. However, the boost it produces has a positive effect. And when you factor the two together, you end up generating more power from the engine, even though the turbo imposes a restriction on the exhaust. Now with the stupid charger, we have to mechanically drive the compressor, and in our case, we're powering the supercharger via a belt and pulley setup. This obviously absorbs power from the engine, however the boost that it produces helps the engine generate more power. It's a necessary evil in order to help the small displacement engine make more power. Now the question is, how much energy are we using, and how much will that affect the fuel economy? So here's something to consider. Is it possible the fuel economy will actually go up instead of down? Well, we'll find out soon enough. Anyway, with the supercharger developing a mere 5 pounds of boost at highway speeds, the intake temperature of the pressurized air is fluctuating between 94 and 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's with the ambient temperature at 61 degrees Fahrenheit. So today we're doing pretty good. A quick check on the side of the road is indicating that the supercharger is actually cold to the touch, so the air flowing past the supercharger is keeping it nice and cool despite it being so close to the exhaust downpipe. This is fantastic news. So after driving 65 miles, we decided to head back to the shop and check our fuel consumption. Fast forward a bit and all the measuring and calculations are done and as I mentioned earlier this car has delivered mind-bending fuel economy in the past and the high water mark is currently at 71.25 miles per US gallon. Well despite the added load on the engine today the car was able to get 74.06 miles to the gallon. Yeah who saw that one coming? I certainly didn't. So a single fuel economy test is not sufficient to make any claims, and generally we do at least two tests in order to validate our numbers. So we dumped some more fuel in the car and headed back to the open roads here in rural Kansas. As usual, the car was running perfectly, but halfway through the test I noticed the boost gauge was showing only two pounds of boost at highway speeds. Now what? Anyway, we finished the test and did our calculations, and this time around we scored 70.11 miles to the gallon. But as you know, the supercharger was malfunctioning. Let's take a quick look and see if we can find the problem. To gain access to the supercharger, the front right wheel has to be removed. Okay, let's take a look. Oh, I see the problem. The drive belt is loosened up. Hmm, well, this is an easy fix and we have a tiny bit of adjustment left, then after that the adjustments are completely maxed out. Hopefully this will hold up long enough for us to complete our tests. 
Well, with the supercharger fixed, we headed out to collect more data. The loose belt provided us with some interesting data, and now that we have everything working correctly again, I wonder if we'll see even more interesting data. Fast forward a few hours and we're back in the shop. Everything went perfectly this time, and I'm afraid to say we didn't score as well as we did previously. So this time around, the car got 73.1 miles to the gallon. Now, personally, I have no idea why we're getting these numbers, but it checks out. You know, the more we fiddle with this one-of-a-kind car, the more secrets we are uncovering. We certainly didn't build this thing for fuel economy, but it seems to be one of its more interesting attributes. So at this point, I can say, yup, the supercharger made our little car faster. As a matter of fact, in the previous video, we shaved something like 12 seconds off the 0 to 55 time on the acceleration test. Meh, this car still ain't fast, but it's a lot faster. All right, now, do we need an intercooler? I would say at this point, definitely not. The charge pipe temperature stayed below 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the driving test, and I reckon that's not bad at all. Now, last year when we put the intercooler on the turbocharged version of this setup, the intercooler made zero difference in performance, it didn't help with fuel economy, and it didn't help lower the exhaust gas temperatures. And the reason is, the charge pipe temperatures were not that hot to begin with. As I recall, without an intercooler, we were seeing 125 degrees Fahrenheit, and with the intercooler, we dropped the temps to just below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Perhaps when we add more boost, it'll be a different story, but until then, we'll leave the intercooler on the shelf. Now, the supercharger itself appears to be getting more than enough airflow to stay cool, and every time we checked it, it was cold to the touch, so we're good there. Now something to keep in mind is, it's still winter here in Kansas, and although it's a very mild winter, we do have the cooler ambient temperatures working for us right now. It's possible when the weather warms up, we'll have to reevaluate some of these areas of concern. I guess my point is, I don't want to focus on or spend time on things that are not a problem right now. So there you have it, an AMR 500 supercharger on a 719cc Kubota diesel engine will help the engine make more power, and as unlikely as it sounds, it also appears to improve fuel efficiency. I think at this point we need to swap in some different pulleys to provide an overdrive to the supercharger so we can see what happens when we increase the boost. I reckon I just made a whole bunch of work for myself, and it looks like I have a lot of stuff to do. And we'll see you next time. Until then. <laughs>